Welcome to Dancing Moon Songcast. I'm Scott Simpson, casting from Dancing Moon Studio in Spearfish Canyon, on the north end of the Black Hills of South Dakota, right on the banks of the Spearfish Creek. If you'd like to follow along, you can download a free PDF from my lyric book from scottsimpsonmusic.com forward slash lyrics. And of course, you can find links to all my music there as well. So let's get casting and find out what song we're going to talk about this time. This episode marks about uh, halfway through our 10-episode series on poetry. Um, Normally, uh, we're talking about songs and songwriting, but uh, we've taken a little little break from the songs to look at... uh, selections from uh, from a poetry collection uh, that uh, of mine that that covers uh, poems written between 1989 and uh, 2009 um, my selected poems uh, collection which is not published uh, may be published at some point the three poems that we're going to look at uh, in this episode um, were all written uh, between uh, 19. 19- 92 and 1996 or so, during a time when um, we were living in uh, York, Nebraska. I was doing a lot of graduate work um, at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, um, and I was teaching at, uh, at York College uh, there in York, Nebraska. Um, and all of these poems, I've selected them. You know, I, try to, I try to kind of uh, pick a poem and then and then um, get a theme and have have uh, find a couple of others uh, from the collection that uh, that kind of fit with that. I would say the theme this week is uh, observing people. All three of these poems are um, based on obs- observations of different uh, different sorts of people. Uh, some very specific. Some very. Uh, exact and, and autobiographical, um, uh, and uh, and uh, then one uh, that is kind of an amalgam of, of several people. Um, but you know how, uh, I don't know if you, when I was a kid, um, I, we would go visit my grandparents, and one of the big things we'd do is go to the mall. Um, and I just remember uh, hours and hours passing just watching uh, people, watching and listening, um, I don't know if you're like me, but uh, watching other human beings um, is a really, um, really fruitful um, sort of thing for my for my thinking, for my reflection, uh, and for for writing. Um, it, it, and I think I think most writers are like that: fiction writers, uh, poetry writers, uh, songwriters. Um, we. Uh, I don't think there's much that's that's more inspiring than than other human beings, um, the ways that they are, the things that they do, um, the things that you can gather about them based on how they're interacting with uh, with those around them. So, anyway, that's a lot of, uh, of a lot of intro before getting into uh, into the poems, but. Uh, uh, I just wanted to set uh, it, this is a, a different kind of theme, and and it's it's a tricky tricky kind of theme because uh, um, uh, these are not uh, people that I know deeply, okay? And so when you observe someone um, at a distance, really, um, or someone that you, you engage with every once in a while, but you, you, don't, you don't know them deeply, um, what comes out of that in the poem probably is more reflective of of you than of them. Um, if you if you understand what I'm saying, um, I can't get inside someone else's head, but watching them and watching them interact and watching the things that they do and the things that they surround themselves with really does invite me into my own head into 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 grappling and uh, with with what's going on with what that what these relationships mean with what 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 I'm seeing and with my own um relationships my own sense of self my own sense of what's important and so i would say that probably all three of these um uh are 
uh, observations of another human being that, that opens a doorway into um, reflection on myself. And so uh, with that in mind, we'll, we'll go ahead and enter into the poems. This first one um, is titled Joe and Marge at the Movies. And it is a uh, what's called a prose poem, which basically means uh, it's not broken into lines. It looks on the page; it looks like a, it looks like prose. It looks like a you know a short paragraph. Um, and uh, so uh, this is Joe and Marge at the movies. They were getting old, and they didn't even know it. Joe smiled like the crow's feet and the false teeth and the double chin didn't show, weren't there. Marge walked just like the base of her neck didn't bow up and hump down into her spine, just like the the index and middle fingers of her right hand weren't twisting slowly year by year as the knuckles grew to the size of chestnuts. Joe held that hand when they strolled down the aisle to find their seats, bought popcorn that they put between them, placing their hands in the sack together, later fighting playfully over the last kernels. And as the movie progressed, Joe slid his arm behind Marge's thin shoulders, resting the crook of his elbow around her crooked back like they were made to fit like that. At the end of the show, Joe would grin big as a kid or maybe cry. Either way, Marge would stretch over with her tiny face and kiss his chin, the touch soft as the muzzle of a colt. They would leave slowly, reluctant as lovers, at the end of a long-awaited first date, wanting to stretch it out, wanting it not to end, waiting to see all the credits, hear the very last note of the closing overture, remarking that movies are just too short. So I think um, I think I was raised um, to really value older folks, my grandparents, my great grandparents. I even I even knew a number of my great grandparents. I uh, I remember as a as a as a middle schooler and as a High schooler uh, going to visit um, with a, with a church group going to visit to old folks' homes to to sing and to talk with the the people there and so I had a lot of opportunities to observe older folks um, and uh, and there's nothing there's nothing quite as as just uh, lovely as an older couple an older couple that's been together for a long time. And, uh, you know, there are lots of jokes about how older couples, as they, you know, the longer they've been together, they more, the more they look like each other. And, and, um, and I, you know, it's kind of a joke, but there's kind of a truth in it as well. I think, I think people over time, as they spend time together, they, they somehow um, shape into puzzle pieces that fit. And they may not have fit as well when they first got, you know, when they were first falling in love, first get, first getting married, first first dating, first going out, you know, there, there may have been some edges that didn't quite fit together. And, and that, you know, that results in all those, those little tensions and those little, those little fights and those little questions about whether, is this really going to work out or, or man, can I, can I stand this guy for this, for, for, uh, you know, any longer? Can I, is this going to work? Um, but over time, as, as all those things work out, 
as all those things work out and, and, the, and the edges, the rough edges get smoothed off. And, uh, and from the outside perspective, people looking at may, may, may just see a couple of old people that are getting older, they're getting humped, they're getting, you know, they're, 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 their fingers are twisting, they're, 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 they're losing their hair, they're whatever. That's, but that's an outside perspective. Uh, and it's an outside perspective that doesn't see very well. From within, if you have the eyes to see it, when the relationship has lasted that long, and I've and I've known some couples um, who had long, long, long relationships like that, and stayed in love the whole time. Oh, they 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 just fit. They just fit like a matched pair. Like like there's no there's no possible way they couldn't have been made to go together. And then the only sad thing is that the movie has to end, you know. And, uh, you know, and existentially maybe it doesn't, you know. Um, perhaps they go on together. That's, that's the hope. That's the, that's the goal of, of humanity, that, it, that it's not over when it's over, that it's, that it's, uh, it's continued into the next, the next stage and um, but for the rest of us watching them from the outside, of course, um, we see that, and and uh, and it's both a, a beauty and and a, and a sorrow to see uh, uh, to see their movie end, um, especially when it's it's a you know a pair of grandparents or or um, and 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 when one passes before the other, um, that can be a a, a, a sad. A sad thing, a difficult thing. Um, but I think, I think for me, um, what I was grasping for was this this thing uh, in which um, these two, um, in the in this poem, Joe and Marge, um, have just um, grown to fit each other grown to fit each other. They have their things that they do. They have their things that they say. They have their jokes. They have their... Um, they just know this is what we do. And uh, I think it's a lovely thing. So, uh, Joe and Marge at the movies. This next one's a very, very short poem. And it's just titled, uh, J. Jay. Jay. Jay used to ride around Lincoln, Nebraska with a little empty child seat on the back of his bike. He told me once that it wasn't the divorce that bothered him. It was her moving to New York, taking little Toby with her. I always think of Jay that way, riding around town with a little empty child seat. So Jay was an, uh, another graduate student that I didn't know very well. And in fact, I, uh, he, he was, uh, I was working on actually a, a graduate degree in creative writing, and as was he, I, I believe he was writing fiction, and um, I was writing uh, poetry. And I did not share this uh, poem with, with Jay because um, um, he shared with me um, this brief and very undetailed story one time. Um, but I, I did always see him around campus, um, and we were in a, a few... Uh, classes together, and I saw him always on his bike, and always with a child seat on the back, and never with a child in the child seat. And uh, he just um, one one evening, I think, when we were meeting about something on a class project, um, 
gave me about that much of the story. And so um, for me, it was very poignant. I, I mean, I was, I, was a, uh, I was a young father with two children and a wife, um, traveling to class in Lincoln, Nebraska, but living just 45 miles away and always home every night, always there with my children. And thinking about one of those children being taken away off to New York because of a, of a marriage that didn't work. And I thought about the idea of always having this empty child seat present um, as a part of who I am. I just have this empty child seat with me all the time. And so that uh, was really the idea behind this very short poem, Jay. I, I didn't, I, as I said, I didn't share it with Jay. We didn't have a, a deep relationship. I, I didn't know how he would take that, how he would take me turning, you know, something that he just shared offhandedly with me um, in a moment, um, turning that into a poem. Um, maybe I should have shared it with him. I don't know. Um, but um, it, it is difficult. Uh, and that's one thing as a, as a writer, um, when, you, um, when you make art, whether it's a poem or a song or especially a, 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 a novel, a fiction, fictional piece or something like that, out of, out of uh, experiences that you've observed or engaged with with other very real people, um, that's that's fraught with with a lot of um, a lot of pitfalls, um, and so you you really have to think twice about about doing that, about how much you change things, um, and then about what you share, uh, either with the people who have inspired these creative pursuits or the people who are experiencing them. Um, and uh, I suppose to some degree, every bit of writing is somewhat autobiographical. But, uh, but of course, folks who write push against that very hard. <laughs> yeah, this was inspired by stuff that really happened. But, uh, but uh, yeah, none of this is real. So, so don't hold me accountable. <laughs> we have uh, one more poem. One more poem. And um, this poem has, uh, it's one of the, I think probably the longest, maybe the longest title uh, for a poem that I ever um, wrote. That, that was kind of a thing for a while, writing a, like a title that was nearly as long as the poem. And this title is not as long as the poem, but it's very long. Um, and so um, when I put it into the... Uh, you know, I, I usually put the titles there um, in the in the title of the podcast. I, I'll I'll just use the first two words. <laughs> so, the full title is "While Waiting in the Cafeteria of Bradshaw Public School for a Meeting, I Check My Watch Once More Before Allowing Myself to Become Distracted." It's a very small cafeteria, I'm thinking, but it's a small town. These must be kindergartners in here doing their art. They're so small. One boy talks loudest. He is bigger than all the rest. He is coloring a map of the U.S. And now I think these may not be kindergartners and maybe this is social studies, not art. My country's purple, he's saying. And his country fits neatly on the eight and a half by eleven dittoed sheet he pinches proudly in his raised hand. His country looks good in purple. Now the children have left me with my cup of coffee and watching one of the cafeteria ladies place the ketchup dispensers 
spacing them evenly across the fold-out tables, preparing for lunch, and the squeeze bottle she sets beside me has a picture of a 1950s housewife dancing the brand name Squeeze Easy in box letters beneath. I haven't seen a Squeeze Easy bottle since I was five and with my parents at Ideal Cafe back home. And suddenly, I am five and thinking my world might fit on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. And somehow maybe I do have the power in one hand to pull out of the box the best color for the whole place. And maybe if I had a hairnet like this cafeteria lady's, her slate curls pulled, contained, held tightly in place, maybe one that keeps my head inside the lines, keeps me from always hurling myself to the far ends of the universe, holds me focused, wraps the whole complicated mess into a clearly labeled Crayola wrapper, then I could make some kind of art with it. So, I had finished uh, my master's, which was in uh, English curriculum and instruction. Uh, and I was teaching at York College, which had a brand new uh, teacher ed program. And so a lot of the things that I was doing was, was uh, uh, visiting um, small schools in the area, in, 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 in that part of Nebraska, either to, uh, to set up a field experiences for teachers, prospective teachers who are going to be going out and doing some work, uh, observing or being uh, helping out in a school, or uh, uh, actually observing student teachers who were placed with teachers in schools. And so I don't recall precisely what I was doing on this visit to uh, Bradshaw Public Schools, um, but I was there apparently a bit early as I recall, and uh, visited the office, and they said I could wait there in the cafeteria um, until the folks I was going to be meeting with uh, were ready. And so as I was there, these were my observations. And... I think, once again, as I said at the beginning of this episode, when you observe others and then you take that and you write about it, quite often, especially if you're creating something like a poem or a song, what comes out is more about you than about them. So I, I did, there were children there, and, and I didn't know anything about the class. I didn't, obviously, I didn't even know exactly what the class was doing, if it was an art class or a social studies class, why they were there in the cafeteria, other than the fact that they were spread out. They had some worksheets that they were coloring on, and this one young man who was very, um, very much the center of attention was very proud. Uh, his His country was colored just right, and and he had done that, and he, I, I felt this sense of, of power, of control that this young man, this very young man had, that he could pick the best color for his country on his eight and a half by 11 sheet. And I, once again, as a, young father, young husband who had finished a master's and was now moving out of teaching in high school, moving into college, taking on additional responsibilities, feeling the weight of not only work but family, but also the weight of, I think, politics, religion, all those big things that we 
think very high and mighty thoughts about um, feeling the need to bring things back to a simplicity, to the kind of simplicity, to the kind of control that happens when you have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and, and, and you just pick the best color for the crayon that you're going to draw. That simplicity, that, that straightforwardness, which I, you recognize as an adult is not a true simplicity. It's an oversimplification. Nothing. Nothing is that simple. Nothing is that pure. Nothing is that straightforward. Nothing is that, um, that easy. Um, but there were reminders of simpler things. The squeeze easy bottle. The cafeteria lady with, with a hairnet setting out the bottles, the children coloring. And these reminders um, for me um, took me to a place of simplicity. And I, maybe, that's, maybe that's a part of, of why I went in to education. Um, education is a complex thing. Learning and teaching are really complex things. They're not easy. They're difficult. Ask any teacher. Ask any educator. Ask any administrator. Ask anyone who works in educational law how simple it is. It's not. Never has been. But at the same time, we're all working toward this, this beautiful, pure, simple thing that begins with a, a young child, a kindergartner, picking out the best crayon and doing something on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that he or she can say, this is mine. This is what I have done. And isn't it just right? Teachers do this complex stuff in service to that sort of simplicity and purity. And we know those kindergartners grow up and we know that they become middle schoolers and have all kinds of challenges and they become high schoolers and then they become adults and they have all of the all of the difficult and we and we are there as educators and indeed as parents watching the 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 simplicity and the and the, and the beauty of childhood knowing that it's going to morph into all kinds of complexity and pain and also joy but valuing that those moments of of clarity and beauty and simplicity when they happen and wanting to be there for that and wanting to nurture it in the right way so that it doesn't twist into something uh, hideous later in life. The things that happen for those children have so much impact on what happens to that young man or young woman or middle-aged man or middle-aged woman. And that's the beauty of being an educator. So we went into education on this one. I, I, that wasn't even the theme. The theme was observing other people. So we, uh, but, but there we go. It, 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 you know, that's, that's, I think that's one of the beauties of, of a poem um, in, in such a very open, structured way, um, able to pursue, able to pursue where the idea goes, where the words take you, where the images carry you, letting yourself be carried along into the things that matter most. Um, for me, as an educator, as a person who's always worked in education, that learning, that idea of, of, of young people learning is, is always not too far from the center of whatever it is I'm talking about or thinking about. So, so there we have it. Um, 
Thank you for joining me uh, for one of these, uh, another one of these uh, uh, poetry episodes. Um, of course, uh, normally uh, here on uh, uh, on the uh, songcast, on the Dance of Moon songcast, we are talking about songs, and uh, you can find all of my music, all of my songs at scottsimpsonmusic.com. And uh, I will find a way uh, here relatively soon to to get some of the, make some of the poetry, especially the poetry that has been part of this series, uh, available. Um, it will be available and is available on the um, on the podcast site at uh, scottsimpsonmusic.podbean.com, and so you can go there and and have the text of these particular poems that uh, that we're looking at in each episode um, there. I appreciate your time. Uh, I, t- I appreciate your your attention. I appreciate being able to spend this time with you, and to spend this time with uh, these poems that uh, that I I haven't spent time with in a few years. It is a a wonderful journey for me, and hopefully brings some uh, some fresh uh, ideas and fresh thinking and fresh images to you as well. Uh, we are closing in on the holiday season that, uh, uh, that is a challenging one at, at, uh, at best. And of course, one that is, is welcomed, um, if you're getting to, uh, spend some time focused on some of the folks that you love, uh, recognize that many of us, uh, during this time of pandemic are not going to be able to be physically, uh, close to, uh, some of the people we would like to be close to. So, uh, my hope for you is that, uh, your holiday season is uh, a good one where you find ways uh, to show those whom you love, uh, to show them your love, even if you can't be right there with them and touching them and hugging them and stuff like that. So this holiday season, stay tuned and be well. <laughs>